Welcome to Domain 7, Westward Expansion. Before we get to today's read aloud, we need to review some things that you should have learned last year. This is a picture of the United States with the 13 colonies. Um, they were originally English colonies, and the people came from England, um, such as the pilgrims, to start a new life in America for religious freedom and for new land. The 13 colonies are loaded on located on the eastern side of the United States and they develop near there because England is closest to the eastern side of the United States. Um, there was a king who ruled over the colonies. He was back in England and in this area there were already Native Americans living here. This next slide is a sideways picture of the Declaration of Independence. This is what the colonists wrote to declare independence from England. Um, they chose the new name, the United States of America. Also at this time, this is showing the Louisiana Purchase. Um, President Jefferson made this purchase from France. Um, it increased the size of the United States, as you can see. Um, Native Americans also already lived in this area, and this allowed the settlers to start moving west. These two gentlemen are Lewis and Clark. Um, they were the ones, they were sent on an expedition by President Jefferson to explore the Louisiana Purchase and find out what was there. And again, Native Americans already lived there, and because of their expedition or journey, um, many settlers decided to start moving west. After the Lewis and Clark expedition, the United States continued to grow and become more crowded in the east. More and more people decided to move westward to the frontier, looking for open land and new opportunities. Um, you learned about the word frontier in fairy tales and tall tales. Frontier can be a boundary or an edge of a country or land, but it can also describe the unexplored areas of a country or place. What was known as the frontier during the westward expansion or growth was the area west of the Mississippi where more and more people moved and settled. We call the people who first settled the new areas of the frontier pioneers. Many of the tall tales you heard were set in this time period. For the next couple of weeks, you will be learning about westward expansion and the exciting innovations or new ideas prompted by a country spreading westward including the invention of steamboats, the building of the Erie Canal, the operation of the Pony Express, and the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. You will also learn about the hardship and tragedy westward expansion caused for both pioneers and Native Americans. You are to listen carefully to learn about the experiences another family has as they move westward. The family in the next read aloud is fictional but based on real people in our country who moved westward in the 1800s. You could have been going west in the 1800s. In those days, there were no cars. You would have traveled in a covered wagon like the one shown here. The covered wagons were called prairie schooners because they were like ships sailing across the prairie. The wagon covers looked like ship sails. Your wagon would have been pulled by horses, mules, or oxen. You and your family would have bumped along unpaved, dusty roads. You would have traveled all day long, and it would have taken you about six months to get from the east to the west. Does that sound like fun? Actually, your trip might have been even harder. Your family would have had to pack everything you owned into a wagon, including personal belongings, clothes, food, water, and supplies. So there wouldn't have even been room for you to ride in the wagon. They packed their belongings into wooden trunks and put the trunks into the wagons. That's right, you might have had to walk all the way to Oregon. In the 1840s and 1850s, tens of thousands of Americans went west in wagon trains. These pioneers hoped to make better life for themselves. Many of them were eager to claim farmland in Oregon or California. They left many of their friends and family behind, loaded everything they had into a wagon, and set off for the West. The following story tells about what it was like to make the trip West. 
unlike some ancient civilizations that we learned about, in which we got most of our information from archaeologists, this account is based on records that people left behind, such as diaries and journals. In this account, the Morgan family makes the trip from Indiana to Oregon. The Morgans were farmers. They hoped to start a new life in Oregon. This is their story. The Morgans left for Oregon in April of 1846. They had a single wagon loaded with all of their belongings. Mrs. Morgan and the young children rode in the wagon. The older children walked alongside. They also helped herd the cows that trailed along behind the wagon. On the first day of their journey, the Morgans traveled 14 miles. When the sun began to set, they set up camp. The boys gathered wood for the campfire. Then Mrs. Morgan cooked supper. After supper, Mrs. Morgan set up beds for the children in the wagon. Once the children were asleep, she lit a candle and wrote the first entry in a journal she had decided to keep. April 11th, 1846, began our journey to Oregon, made 14 miles on our first day. The sun felt warm upon our skin as we made our way along. Our journey was brightened by the wildflowers that dotted the landscape. By the time we made camp, the older children were exhausted from walking. I have to admit that I gave them each a little extra stew for supper tonight. For the next few weeks, the Morgans traveled west across Indiana and Illinois. They rose early each morning and traveled until just before sundown. On their good days, they covered 20 miles. When it rained or the roads were bad, they covered fewer. About one month after starting their journey, the Morgans reached the Mississippi River. They hired a ferry to carry them their wagon, and their animals across the river. On that day, Mrs. Morgan had a lot to write in her journal. This is some of what she wrote. May 10, 1846. The great Mississippi is wider than I could ever have imagined. Our wagon, our horses, and our supplies were loaded onto a flat boat and carried across the mighty Mississippi. I held my breath as I watched all our earthly possessions float away. Another month later, the Morgans reached St. Joseph, Missouri, where they bought food and supplies. The next morning, they crossed the Missouri River. This meant they were leaving the United States and were entering an area people called Indian Territory. On this day, Mrs. Morgan wrote in her journal, June 5, 1846, the children are hoping to see Indians. We have been told the Cheyenne and the Pawnee live in the area we are traveling through. We have heard that they are sometimes willing to trade horses and food for clothes and tobacco. A few days later, the Morgans turned onto the main road to Oregon, known as the Oregon Trail. There were many other settlers traveling on this road. The Morgans joined up with a group of more than 100 settlers traveling to Oregon. By mid-June, the wagon train was crossing the Great Plains. On all sides, they saw vast open fields of grass without a tree in sight. The Morgans also began to see large herds of buffalo. They noticed that these magnificent creatures spent much of their time with their heads bowed, grazing on the abundant grass. On one moonlit June night, as a star sparkled in the sky, Mr. Morgan shot a buffalo, and Mrs. Morgan cooked the meat for supper. On that night, Mrs. Morgan wrote in her journal, June 14, 1846, buffalo meat, although tasty, takes a lot of chewing. I watched the children eat as the flames from the flickering fire lit their dirty faces. The good thing was that while they were chewing, they weren't complaining. A few days later, the Morgan's wagon broke. Mrs. Morgan stood guard all night in the rain while Mr. Morgan fixed the wagon. Two weeks later, something even worse happened. Eight of the oxen that pulled the Morgan's wagon vanished during the night. The Morgans searched for the animals but could not find them. They hitched up some of their cows instead, but these animals were not used to pulling a wagon, and the Morgans made slow progress until they could get better animals. In mid-July, the Morgans reached Chimney Rock in what is now Nebraska. You can see Chimney Rock in this photograph. While admiring the sights, Mrs. Morgan and a friend almost got caught in a hailstorm. This is what Mrs. Morgan had to say about this adventure that evening in her journal. July 15th, 1846. We are making much slower progress. Yesterday we only covered 11 miles. We were delighted to see Chimney Rock, though we had the most dreadful hailstorm. 
Mrs. Peterson and I were pelted by hailstones the size of small rocks. The hailstones tore some of the wagon covers off, broke some boughs, and scared several of the oxen away. A few days later, the wagon train reached Fort Laramie in Wyoming, another common landmark on the trip for pioneers heading west. Two weeks later, they crossed the Rocky Mountains. Mrs. Morgan wrote, August 9, 1846. We wound our way over the mountains along a very crooked road. Had rain and hail today, which made it very disagreeable experience. However, Papa and I smiled so as not to discourage the children. In late August, the Morgans traveled across a dry, dusty desert. Mrs. Morgan wrote that the dustiness was like nothing her friends in the East had ever seen. August 30th, 1846. My friends back East know nothing about dust. This dust makes it impossible for us to see where we are going. We cannot even see the oxen that pull our wagon. The cattle struggle to breathe and we have a taste of the dusty air in our mouths all the time. When the children go to sleep, every one of them is covered in a layer of dust. In mid-September, the Morgans encountered some Native Americans on their journey. Mrs. Morgan wrote, September 14, 1846, we saw Native Americans along Snake River. They have few horses and no blankets. The immigrants are happy to trade them old clothes for fish. Toward the end of September, a young woman in the Morgan's party decided she had had enough of the Oregon Trail. She sat down on the side of the trail and claimed that she could travel no further. Then she began to sob loudly. The Morgans felt sympathy for her, but there was nothing else to do but press on. In mid-November, the Morgans reached Fort Dallas, Oregon, on the banks of the Columbia River. They built a raft that would carry them and their things down the river. Unfortunately, it had been raining for several days. The river was flooded and running too fast for raft travel. The Morgans had to wait for several days by the riverside. It was cold, rainy, and windy. The Morgans huddled around a campfire to try and stay warm. Mrs. Morgan recorded two entries while they waited for the weather to improve. November 14, 1846. We are unable to move forward. We must wait for the wind to ease. We have one day's provisions left. The warm sunshine has abandoned us, and we are chilled to the bone. November 16, 1846. No let up in the weather. If anything, it is worse. Waves rise up over our simple raft. It is so very cold that icicles hang down from the wagon. On all sides, we see the vast open fields of grass without a tree in sight. Finally, the Morgans were able to make their way down the river to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. This painting shows what an Oregon town looked like at that time in the 1800s. Unfortunately, toward the end of the trip, Mr. Morgan had fallen ill. Mrs. Morgan rented a tiny house in Portland, and with the help of some kind men, the Morgans moved into the tiny house for the winter. Mrs. Morgan sold the last possessions to buy food. Mr. Morgan was so sick he could not get out of bed. Some of the children got sick as well. Many people during that time got sick because of unsanitary conditions and lack of medical care, so there weren't any doctors. Mrs. Morgan was so busy caring for her family that she stopped writing in her journal for a while. In mid-February, she started again. February 13, 1846. It rains constantly. Our house is cold and the roof leaks badly. It is difficult to keep our spirits up. We are only able to eat one good meal a day. We still dream of our new home in Oregon. I know we will get there. Mr. Morgan recovered, and in the spring, the Morgan family settled on a farm in Oregon. The Morgan's family's journey ended well, though for many others who traveled west, it did not. So the next time you're on a long trip, thinking how boring and terrible it is, think of the Morgans and their trip to Oregon, and remember, it could be worse.